morning and welcome to Skipton Baptist Church Online. It's great to have you with us as we continue our series of SBC Connect. Now, a few years ago, uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but um, apparently we went through a thing called a global pandemic. And the reason I say apparently is because it just feels so odd that we went through all that, didn't we? All the testing, all the restrictions, the adaptations, the suffering, the learning, the isolation, the rallying around, the rapid acquisition of IT skills. And it was during that time and as we came out of it, so much was reflected upon and learned. And one particularly key word or concept arose to the top with regard to here, us here at SBC. So much so that it's become the anchor word around which we re-envisioned our small group ministry here. And it was connect or connection or reconnect. And so it's not just that we jumped on a cool new word for our house group, home group, cell group, midweek group activities. There was a real purpose and I would say a prophetic significance to the choice of word and concept. And as we decided to look at the church over these last, these last few weeks and the weeks to come, SBC Connect. The five W's of our Connect group seem to be a really good place to start. And so far we've looked at worship, we've looked at word, and this week we reflect on the third of the W's, witness. Now my sense so far is that we have we enjoy the this, this sense of worship and perhaps we appreciate the importance of word, maybe with a sense of, oh yes, we could do better. But when it comes to witness, if we're really honest, I wonder if there is the feeling of, do we really have to? One of the difficulties um, of being here for so long at SBC is that you end up revisiting previous passages, concepts, themes and sermons. And you don't really want to repeat yourself and be unoriginal. But at the same time, certain topics are important and, and need to be repeated. So some of what I'll cover this morning will not be new. It may sound familiar even to the point of me plagiarising myself from other things. And I don't and can't apologise about that because as during the preparation of this sermon, I find myself again challenged about this area of witnessing, about the area of evangelism. So don't worry if you're having some kind of sense of deja vu, you've heard this before. I am repeating myself at certain points, but rest assured I'm repeating myself to myself as well. But before we look at a few aspects of witness and witnessing, there's an important starting point. During my sabbatical, um, I was doing a bit of reading and reflecting over a number of different areas. And one concept which came up again and again um, came, comes from uh, one of the most popular TED Talks ever. And it's from a man called Simon Sinek. And he's written a book and the theme was Start With Why. And I suspect uh, we'll hear more of this refrain uh, many more times in the future. I know the team already have done. But when it comes to witness... I want to reflect on three C's briefly, and I'm sure there'll be many other reasons, but three C's as to why we witness. I think it's fundamental we ask that question. And the first C is call. Simply put, Jesus has told us to do it. And in one sense, that should be enough, shouldn't it? In Matthew 28, we have the Great Commission where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. J. John paraphrases this to say, we're commanded and commissioned by Jesus to make, mark and mature disciples of Jesus. Disciples or apprentices of Jesus, following the way of the rabbi, living the life of Jesus. And note, this is a commission to us all, not just the keen bean extrovert evangelists among us. And also notice this is not about making converts, but disciples, apprentices, of Jesus and mature ones at that. It goes beyond the sinner's prayer. And in Acts 1 verse 8, we only looked at this just last year, there was a key verse at the very start where Jesus says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. And then our reading that we're going to be looking at a little bit is in 2 Corinthians in verse 5 or chapter 5, where Paul reminds us that we are Christ's ambassadors, his representatives, as though God was making his appeal through us. We are called to continue Jesus's work. But as people, we're generally pretty disobedient as human beings, aren't we? 
In fact, I think it's quite laughable. We read of Jesus in the Gospels early in his ministry, healing and delivering particular people. And he actually commands them, do not tell people about him. And what do they go and do? They tell everyone. And then Jesus tells us, please tell others about me. And what do we tend to do? We retreat into our shells and we keep quiet. Yet we can't escape the truth that Jesus has called us to follow him. And that following involves continuing his work of spreading and sharing the good news of his kingship. But that call comes from our second C, which is compassion. In Matthew 9, 35 to 38, Jesus was going around the towns and villages, teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God, healing and diseases and sicknesses. And it says in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers to his harvest field. These verses struck me this week, particularly upon reading um, a specific Facebook post. Now, yes, I use Facebook. Other social media platforms are available. But in the midst of nosy scrolling and seeing what was going on in the people's lives, at times you get an insight into what's really going on in the world. And a recent post on a local page was from a lady who asked a question to the mind of social media. And the question was, would anyone be interested in the local community for an evening of clairvoyance and mediumship? Now, I've seen adverts like this before, but this one seemed different. And it was different because of the response. There were more than 500 responses and likes or comments, the majority of which were positively expressing interest. Now, once I would have been that gung-ho spiritual warfare, let's go get them. But not this time. This time, these words of Jesus from Matthew's gospel resonated and echoed through my soul. Now, I don't know all the various reasons why people responded as they did. Probably are very, very. But the Lord laid on my heart three points that that reflect something of what maybe is going on. The first thing was that there are so many desperate people out there. There are sheep without their shepherd, lost and yet looking for something, hurting, disoriented by the world that they are experiencing, lacking hope and purpose, a sense of meaning, a sense of worth and a sense of value. So many desperate people and that post exemplified that. But also in my heart was a sense of so many people have discounted the church as a place or a people to turn to and most, uh, or at most, they will have included Christianity in their pick and mix personalized spirituality. And the third thing is this what have we done as the followers of Jesus, historic, and what are we doing presently with our Lord Jesus, who attracted crowds to whom the desperate turn to for hope, where the broken find healing and the lost find a home? What has happened to this friend of sinners who has been, who is now repelled, avoided and discredited? Keith Green, a uh, singer-songwriter in the 1970s, he wrote a song called Asleep in the Light. I think it really challenges us where he says the world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. The writer Blaise Pascal um, echoes St. Augustine when he talks about um, a God-shaped hole in everyone's heart and lives that only God can fill. And in the 1990s, those philosophers, the band Extreme, say in their song, wholehearted, words like this, um, Yet even the sea is not so full of me. If I'm not blind, why can't I see that a circle can't fit where a square should be? There's a hole in my heart that can only be filled by you. That resonates, doesn't it? I don't know what your response is to hearing that, that snapshot of a spiritual reality that's out there beyond our walls. My encouragement is that we don't fight against the enemy, but that in prayer we fight for the lost. May any anger we might feel or annoyance or grief be turned through the Holy Spirit to an impetus for the lost, for that compassion for those who are broken. Because the third C is conviction. Why do we witness? 
because I believe we have something to offer. Or at least that's the correct answer, isn't it? The question I ask myself and to all of us is, do we truly believe and think that it's better to follow Jesus than not? Do we truly believe and think that people are lost without knowing Jesus, both now in this life and for eternity? Because how we honestly answer these questions will explain so much about how we personally feel and uh, feel about and approach witnessing to others. And trust me, this is in no way about guilt tripping, seriously, because this has really challenged me about going beyond the should to the heart of why. If we don't truly believe those things about Jesus, then I think we're off the hook. We don't need to witness. In fact, it's disingenuous if we do, because all we'll be doing is drumming up newcomers for our nice private members club. But if we think and believe that Jesus Christ really is the way, the truth, the life, because we know it personally ourselves, then what is stopping us sharing that reality with those around us? In fact, why can't they tell from who we are that this is true? So I wonder if the, if we've looked at the whys, what about the why nots? I think for so many of us, the root of not witnessing is fear. Fear of inadequacy, perhaps. Fear of losing reputation or, or perhaps gaining an unwanted one. Fear of rejection, getting it wrong. Fear of hypocrisy. And what if I preach a gospel and then I'm not actually able to do to follow this up? What about a fear of relativism? Accused of being a fundamentalist, extremist or something else. A sense of shame, perhaps. We know who we confess to be the way to live. We know the truth in a world of deception and lies. And we know the life, but now in eternal, his name is Jesus. And yet we, yet we seem to be willing to see our friends, our family, our colleagues dabbling with death. As opposed to learning the way to life. My friends, in our community, our workplaces, our clubs, our friendships and homes, there is such brokenness, pain, worthlessness, as well as much joy and laughter. I'm not denying that at all. But in that brokenness in this world, we need to remember we are broken in the church too. Let's not pretend otherwise. But actually, let's celebrate that this is the place to be if you're broken. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest, was what Jesus said. And there is, unfortunately, and undeniably, at the very least, a wariness of Christianity at the moment. After decades, centuries even, of Christendom, of the church in charge, which I never think is necessarily a good thing. So what to do in the midst of this? Jesus calls us to be salt and light, to show and tell a different story. It's great when you listen to a good storyteller, isn't it? In their words, they can transport us in our minds and imaginations to places and situations beyond our capacity or reality. Jesus was a good storyteller. He was well known for it, wasn't he? People were enraptured by his imagery, entertained by his insights into how the world is and enthralled by his imagination of how the world could and should be. But with Jesus and with us, the question is, where is the hyphen? And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is good storyteller to good storyteller. That's what we're meant to be. Tellers of a different, better story than that which is common throughout our world and culture. How can we be good storytellers? And for that this morning, I want to look at the three witnesses as we look at the whole area of witnessing. Now, as far as I'm aware, in a court case, I read that there are three types of witness, each with their own angle, each with their own sort of testimonies. And I think we could do with being examples of all three. And the first one is the expert witness, one who understands the facts and can explain them, explain them in an understandable way. And when it comes to sharing the gospel, we may rule ourselves out of this expert category. And there are those who absolutely have the gift for evangelism and witnessing, skilled in the communication of the gospel explanation. Think of Billy Graham, J. John, for instance. Or there's other methods like a course, like Alpha or Christianity Explored. 
at other things which presents the gospel clearly and succinctly. We're finding that with running our Alpha course, such great presentation of the gospel and they're great resources. But there is still a sense that we also need to be expert witnesses. And for us, it's a case of know what you believe and why you believe it. This has always been a key aspect and a key passion of mine in my ministry outlook from the earliest days of youth ministry even, to help and encourage fellow disciples regardless of age to think about what they believe and to know that it is a reasonable way to follow and to live. And we genuinely don't have to be able to explain everything to be able to answer every question fully. In fact, it's often better not to try at times if we don't know. But can you explain the heart of the gospel? Can you explain what it means to be a Christian? Do you know how to lead someone to Christ if they ask you? Because it just might happen. And whilst we can cling to that promise that Jesus gives in Matthew 10, that the Holy Spirit would give us words to say to kings and governors, but I think it's also highly advisable to think beforehand to, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 15, to be ready, to be prepared. There are lots of ways of explaining. It's like the gospel is a multifaceted diamond. Which facet resonates most with you? Which door is it that you went through to, to meet Jesus? Because people enter through different doors, but ultimately every door must lead to the cross of Christ. There are pictures, models, images, stories, verses, mnemonics of how to explain the gospel. There's the bridge, the chasm between us and God that only Jesus can, can straddle through the cross. There's the exam paper where the pass mark is 100% and we can never reach that, but Jesus does it for us. There's the payment of a debt or fine or punishment that Jesus pays on our behalf, satisfying justice and mercy. There's having dirty clothes which are washed clean by what Jesus did on the cross. There's the gospel colours which explain different aspects from creation through to eternity. There's the four points that might explain the four aspects of, of, of the gospel. There's the gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16 or similar verse. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and our reading, there's the story of reconnection, where God reconnects us to him and gives us the ministry of reconnection. Whatever aspect it is, prepare, practice, think about it. And spoiler alert, you will be asked a connect group to share the gospel with someone. Think about which picture you would use to explain it to someone. Make sure you understand it reflects your experience of the good news of Jesus Christ. Think about those common questions that people may ask, the ones you dread to be asked. What might your response be? Think about it in advance, knowing that I don't know is okay, then being prepared to share what you do know. Remember, you will never argue anyone into heaven or convince someone to become a Christian because salvation is God's work, not ours. Sowing seeds is ours, or at the very least, preparing the soil. We're called maybe to be expert witnesses. We're also called to be eyewitnesses, those who tell our story, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us, God. We should know what we believe and why we believe it and try to be able to explain it with our Christian jargon. But most people in our postmodern world are less interested about whether something makes sense and more about whether it works. Just think about selling of products and services today. We can be impressed by shiny adverts and effervescent explanations of products and reasoning why you need this thing. But how many of us online scroll down to the customer and guest reviews? We want to know from people's experience whether what is advertised is true or not. Customer review, reviews, TripAdvisor, personal recommendations. And isn't it really annoying whenever you want to buy something or have maybe book something and there's hundreds of five star reviews, but yet there's the one one star review and it still makes you feel wary because of it. We may not understand every aspect of the gospel and hint no one fully does. We may not be able to answer every question and difficulty and another hint. Some of these questions don't have answers or full answers anyway. 
but you do have a story. You are a good story teller. I think this is brilliantly demonstrated in John chapter 9, where Jesus has healed a blind man. And uh, Jesus goes off and the blind man's just kind of left there. And, and the religious authorities come and question him and they grill him about Jesus. And he can't answer their questions or explain accurately who Jesus is. But he does say this. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. He had a story to tell. He had a good story to tell. Seven words long. I was blind, but now I see. To be an eyewitness, it must be first-hand testimony. Otherwise, it's inadmissible in court. It's hearsay. Someone else's story. So what is your story? We've got a collection of our church family's God stories on YouTube, um, which are accessible at any time. And they're built around two questions we focused on during our Do You Know Him series. How did you come to know Jesus? And what difference does Jesus make in your life? Does knowing Jesus make in your life? Can you answer those questions? Can you tell your story in three minutes? Can you do it in 10 minutes? Can you do it in six or seven words? And spoiler number two, you will be asked to share it at Connect Group this week. And maybe if someone's brave, they might even ask you over coffee this morning. So be prepared. In fact, get prepared to know what you believe, why you believe it, and to know how you would tell your story if someone asked. Because your story matters Fireworks or flowers, glorious or gradual, every story, every Jesus story about you is important. But please make sure it's not a history account, but a current affairs report. Make sure that your Christian CV is up to date, that you have a live connection with Jesus now. If your connection with Jesus is live and active, it is so much easier to share your story about what God is doing in your life right now. And for that, we need to become increasingly God aware. Where and when have you seen God at work? In the miraculous, in the mundane, in the every day of the week. And you may think I've got nothing really to share. Maybe it's because we're not looking there's a famous quote by Sherlock Holmes in A Scandal in Bohemia, and he says to um, those around him, you see, but you do not observe. And our prayer is light of the world who stepped down into darkness. Open my eyes. Let me see. Let us see your hand at work, Lord. And may we talk about it. Because here, witnessing is not just about sharing Jesus with non-Christians. One aspect of the Connect Group's W is sharing with others where and when you've seen God at work in your week in order to encourage everyone needs a faith lift, don't we? We need to increase our God talk at Connect Group, over coffee, in the street, on the phone, through text messages and WhatsApp. And before we know it, it will become part of our vocabulary and vernacular God talk. We hear this in Acts 4, 18 to 20, when Peter and the apostles have been doing all these things. They're, called, they're, they're teaching and they're preaching and they're showing the kingdom of God through miracles. And they're called in by the Sanhedrin. They're, set, they're told they're commanded to not speak in the name of Jesus. And, and Peter and John reply, listen, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Cannot help. Another way of saying it is cannot help not speak. In fact, in literal translations, we are not able to not speak about what we've seen and heard. May our God talk be so natural that our God story comes out in our everyday conversations. Expert witness, eyewitness, and the third witness is a character witness who demonstrates the character of the person in question. One of the key verses I find about sharing our faith or not being ready for it is in 1 Peter 3, 15. It says, be prepared to give an answer to those who ask. Our answer is in response to an inquiry from a person. It's not forced upon them. But is there enough 
of the something about you that will provoke the question or query in the first place. What might draw people to ask that inquiry, ask a question or inquiry about you? I heard a brilliant story at a conference I was at just this last week, and it was about a, a church team meeting. And one member, their community worker on the team, always at every meeting went around the team and offered to make tea or coffee or anything else people needed. And another member of the team uh, jokingly said to her, Jane, why do you keep doing that? It's making the rest of us look bad when we don't. And another member of the team piped up without thinking and said, oh, don't mind her. She's just a little bit Jesus. Just a little bit Jesus. It slapped me across the face, that phrase. And my response was, oh, that that could be said of me. And maybe you ask that, oh, that could be said of you as well. He's just a little bit Jesus. We think about wanting to be like Jesus and we see a whole package and we think it's unachievable. Could it be just a little bit Jesus that might just draw attention? Some of you know it was with real sadness that we lost a friend and colleague in Peter Thomas, recently minister of Grassington Congregational and worker in, in schools. And it was his funeral on Friday and there was a, a Thanksgiving time at um, Grassington Town Hall. And a number of tributes, amazing tributes about Peter, tributes about the man. But what rang out massively loud and clear was here was someone who was just a little bit Jesus and had left a legacy. In Acts 4 verse 13, it says when they saw the courage of Peter and John realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note what did they take note of? That they had been with Jesus. They noticed they'd been with Jesus. Are you Jesus enough for people to notice and perhaps ask why? By the way, this is not pretense. This is a transformative work of the Holy Spirit. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more we will sound and act like him. And if we are open to the work of the Holy Spirit, it's almost a spiritual inevitability. But it may be years until people notice or appreciate or comment. It's certainly been my experience with certain friends and family that it's been years before they admitted that their criticism, cynicism and even ridicule of me was wrong as they noticed there was something different. Here again. Those words from 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconnected us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconnection. That God was reconnecting the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconnection. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, his representatives, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconnected with God. God made him who had no sin be sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God. Powerful words. But in this we hear the heart of the gospel. God reconnecting us to him. God's heart desire that the world be reconnected to him in Jesus. Our ongoing role in that ministry and message of reconnection. Words of imploring, pleading, begging, conviction for others to connect with God and a reflection of the heart behind it. Do we actually share God's heart and desperation for the lost? To share the story that God made sinless Jesus be sin for us. That we could be right with him and reconnected with him. Because if we do, hear this then. Now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Music